Welcome everybody to Inside Asian Gaming's Trade Talk. My name is Ben Blaschke, Managing Editor of Inside Asian Gaming. Those of you who follow IAG may have recently read that Macau-based electronic gaming equipment distributor Asia Pioneer Entertainment has unveiled plans to engage and participate in the development of the Metaverse uh, new strategy for them uh, in order to provide a platform of engagement for the travel and hospitality sectors. Topic of the Metaverse, of course, is, uh, has very much come to the fore recently and uh, it's uh, very much is going to change the way we travel in the future. Uh, it's emerging as a fascinating segment of uh, this exciting new technology. And to talk about this, I'd like to welcome our special guest today, uh, a specialist in the Metaverse, Web3 and Extended Reality, uh, Steve Banbury. Great to talk to you, Steve. How are you? Hey, man. How are you? Good to speak to you. You too. So I thought we may as well start very generally, Steve. Uh, could you start by explaining to our audience who might not be fully familiar yet with uh, exactly what the Metaverse is? Yeah, for sure. And, and, and in 2022, it's an interesting question because it's become one of these terms that different organizations, different companies, even different governments at this point, are, they're trying to mold it into what they believe it should be. Um, the term itself comes from, uh, it was originally from author Neil Stevenson's book, Snow Crash, in the 90s. Um, and then it was echoed in Any Clients or Any Player One, which is probably a better known um, uh, piece of fiction, especially because of the Spielberg movie that was then um, adapted from it. Essentially, the concept of the metaverse was, you know, was originally stated to be this idea of a persistent virtual reality world where multiple people can come together, engage with, um, you know, digital objects, digital spaces, and each other. Uh, I guess one of sorry, Steve. I guess one of no, the no, no, no. One of the big questions a lot of people ask when they first sort of hear what's going on with the metaverse and metaverses around the world is, is why? I mean, how would you answer that question? So pretty much in, in the same way that, you know, for, for years now I've worked with virtual reality and, you know, I'm a big, you know, big fan of Simon Sinek's work, the golden circle principle, start with why. You know, if you don't know why you're doing something and especially when, you know, a lot of the work that I was doing was in ed education and, and training, you know, for a school, for a learning institution or university, you know, understanding the why of ed tech was always absolutely crucial. You know, schools were throwing all kinds of money at iPads and all kinds of new gadgets and, and they didn't often think about why they were doing it. They were doing it because it, it looks like the, the thing that they needed to be doing. When it comes to VR and, you know, by extension, the, the concept of the metaverse, the the thing, the, the, the point that I would always drive people back towards is, is quite simple, really. It's the fact that our world is 3D. We live in a three-dimensional world. And so whilst the 2D screens that we have engaged with digital content through for, you know, decades now, you know, they, whilst they have been, the, you know, our conduit towards the digital space, at the same time, that, that black mirror is the boundary, it is the barrier that prevents us from engaging with it in a natural way. Best example I can give you is, you know, there's, there's plenty of uh, platforms, plenty of tools, plenty of apps now that allow you to engage with 3D objects uh, on a 2D device. So, for example, I could load up a 3D model on my 2D iPad screen and I can manipulate that model with my fingers, but it's not natural. It doesn't make sense for me to engage with, a, you know, a model of a coffee cup. I want to be able to, you know, pick it up, turn it around uh, and look at it in a more natural way. Because as, as a human, because we live in a 3D world, that makes more sense to me. It also allows me to go beyond that because within virtual spaces, I can break the laws of physics. So I can take my coffee cup, I can scale it up to a thousand times its actual size and look at it in minute detail. I can... You know, if I'm a car designer, I can look at a car, I can move around the design of a car, <coughs> excuse me. But I can also just reach and pick that car up, which I couldn't do with a physical model in the real world. So it's at once allowing me to go beyond what I've traditionally been able to do and how I've traditionally been able to interact with digital content through a, a 2D screen, but also allows me to go beyond what I can do in the real world. You raised an interesting point before. You mentioned that um, you know with various technologies in the past that 
perhaps some companies have delved in without really knowing why. Do you think that uh, at this particular point in time that a lot of companies that are are looking at, you know, or they're hearing about metaverse and all these new technologies, do, do you think they fully understand the opportunities at this present point? Um, <clears throat> I think that there are some that do and some that don't. And I think that, um, you know, I, I was just talking to somebody again last week about uh, last year when, uh, when Zuckerberg announced that Facebook was becoming meta. What was very interesting to me is in the last, in 2021, I quite heavily went down the, the Web3 NFT blockchain rabbit hole, which is, you know, it's a space that is very much converging with the world that I've worked in for the last few years in, in terms of immersive technology. But what was really interesting was when that was announced, the amount of people in that space that came out calling for Zuckerberg's head, like, this is not our metaverse. He's just trying to steal it. He doesn't know what he's doing. And I ended up putting out a, a thread on social media just highlighting the fact that, you know, if, if you want to learn about virtual reality and, and the way that virtual reality impacts us as human beings, the seminal text is Jeremy Balenson's experience on demand. Uh, Jeremy is the founding director of the Immersive, uh, the Immersive Human Interaction Lab at Stanford. Uh, great guy. And, and his book really is, you know, the, the, the epitome of, 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 of uh, theory and research into virtual reality. Balenson's book literally starts with Mark Zuckerberg is about to walk the plank. And this is from 2013 when Zuckerberg having already identified that this, you know, this space, this technology had the potential to be the next, you know, groundbreaking, game-changing thing in, in terms of technology. He was there, you know, a decade ago with some of the best minds, and you know, in space researching. He was there doing his own research, looking into this. This wasn't some knee-jerk reaction last year. This was, you know, the culmination of a, of a 10 year journey, which encompassed, you know, Facebook and, and, and buying out Oculus and now moving towards rebranding because he sees the evolution. He saw it coming and had the foresight to see it coming. I, I do think that there are other organizations that have followed suit. They've either followed what he's been doing or, you know, on their on their own path. Um, and obviously, the, you know, the, the big hitters, your, 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 your Googles, your Apples, your Microsofts, they're, they're very much, you know, always, they're always going to be ahead of the curve in terms of new technologies and the way that um, new technologies can be, you know, researched and deployed. Um, when it comes to companies from other verticals, from other industries, I think that there are definitely some that have been very forward thinking and very proactive in terms of, you know, understanding the space and, and the, the power, potential possibility of, of how this technology can, you know, disrupt and redefine their particular industries. But of course, you're going to get some that are jumping on a bandwagon because they're worried about being left behind. Absolutely. Uh, so let's, Steve, we'll talk a bit about, I mentioned Asia Pioneer Entertainment before, but there's, there's many companies in the the travel, tour, tourism, and integrated resort sectors that are starting to think on this on this level. Uh, I guess if there's one thing COVID has taught us, it's the need to think outside the box. So when we're talking travel and tourism operators, I mean, what sort of opportunities does the metaverse provide them? So the way that I see it, you, you've essentially got three levels to this. And I think that there's the, the simplest and easiest entry point which you know companies could start to and, and some companies already are uh, adopting now there's the next step and then there's the kind of like wall out there kind of concept um, but I do believe that all three are inevitable so the, you know the, the, the simplest level you'll see more and more tourism operators more and more travel companies start to look at how they can harness uh, virtual reality harness um, immersive tech and, and and you know we're going to hang that concept of the metaverse because again this it relates back to my first answer in terms of how people use this term it's now being you know it's become a bit of a buzzword so people will throw that term around just because there's a VR headset involved and it doesn't necessarily mean that and conversely it doesn't mean that it can't be a metaverse if you don't have a headset 
But I think the entry point for a lot will be harnessing this kind of tech to showcase destinations. Okay, so the, the natural evolution from having a carousel of photos on a website um, or a video clip on a website towards an experience where you're trying to sell um, somebody on the idea of visiting Sri Lanka. Um, here, you can you know, put this headset on, you can go into this virtual space and you can experience some highlights of what you will see when you, you, know, when you go on this holiday. The next step I would say beyond that is then actually parking up and uh, taking up permanent residence in, this is where the term the metaverse really comes in, okay? So persistent virtual spaces, you've got multiple um, platforms already that are using blockchain NFTs to be able to sell plots of virtual land, the sandbox, the central land, Somnium space. Um, so we will see a shift towards companies having a presence in the metaverse as well as in the real world. And to be honest, we're already seeing this across so many sectors. Uh, you know, literally in the last 48 hours here in Dubai, the, the government has announced the, the formation of the Virtual Assets Regulatory Authority. Their office is in the sandbox. Okay, that they, they, they have, uh, from, from what I can tell, they have no physical office. Their office, their headquarters is being built in the sandbox metaverse, in the sandbox virtual reality space. And, you know, they'll be sitting there alongside the likes of Nike and McDonald's and Gucci and all of these other, you know, forward-thinking companies that have seen that, you know, Okay, right now, there's only X percentage of people accessing this stuff, but this is where we're heading. So we're going to park, you know, we're going to take, put, uh, you know, stick our, our flag in, in, in the ground early and you know, claim our, our space of this territory. Um, so I do think that that's the second stage is you've then got this persistent space. It almost becomes an extra marketing vertical for a company because, you know, suddenly you've got... I know, sticking with my example of Sri Lanka, so it might be that the, the Sri Lankan government buy a chunk of space inside uh, you know, a, a metaverse world where they've got this permanent visit Sri Lanka destination, you know, um, kind of like you get, obviously here in Dubai, we've just recently had the expo and every, every country had its own pavilion, which was showcasing innovation in that country and the highlights of that country. I can see something like that for each country, but I can also see then travel operators, you know, the likes of Emirates, having somewhere where it's almost, uh, uh, you know, a permanent digital residence, very much like it's the transposition of the, of the website. It's the idea that, you know, we have our website and it's always on. And, you know, if you flash back 20 years and most companies didn't have a website, every company at the moment doesn't have a virtual space in the metaverse, but they will. They will all have this space. Um, then the third step is the slightly more, <laughs> you know, it's the one that sort of blows minds a bit more. Um, and I stood on stage at a, a travel conference a couple of weeks ago. And when I walked on stage, I said, I said, at the end of this presentation, 50% of you are, are, are going to be absolutely terrified. And I said, and if that's true, I've probably done my job because, you know, this type of new thinking, it is scary to people. People do get uh, set in their ways. But the simple fact is that the concept of metaverse vacations will become a thing. Now, am I saying, again, sticking with that analogy with, uh, with Sri Lanka, am I saying that people will stop visiting Sri Lanka because they can virtually visit Sri Lanka? No, I'm not. Of course not. Okay, It's, it's never going to be the same as going there in person. But there's a fair few people around the world that can't ever visit Sri Lanka. They can't afford to visit Sri Lanka. They can't because of other um, limitations in terms of visas or something like that. They can't because of maybe a health issue that means that they can't travel or they can't travel that far. So having a, you know, a virtual experience, and I'm not saying that you're going to stick headset on for two weeks you know, and, and, and replicate that, but being able to go on a, a virtual tour of, of somewhere that you can't visit. Again, it comes back to that idea that VR allows us to, you know, to break the laws of physics. It also allows us to break the laws of space and time. So I can put a headset on and be in Sri Lanka right now. I don't need to go on a plane for X amount of hours or spend X amount of money. 
But of course, it also means that we can start to visit the impossible. So you will see, you know, forward thinking travel operators start to offer trips to the past or to the future or to Mars or Saturn or to uh, Hobbiton from Lord of the Rings or to, you know, to uh, one of the, uh, the planets from Star Wars or something like that. You know, that there will be scope for these virtual tours and virtual travel destinations that are beyond the realm of what's possible in the real world. Will this, um, you know, completely erase actual travel? Of course it won't. It's not the same thing. Um, but will it complement it and will it allow people who potentially can't travel in the real world for, you know, various reasons? Um, yes, it will. It's bound to. But I don't think that we're going to get there, I would say, probably for another decade because we're almost at this point waiting for the technology to catch up. And as fast as immersive tech has developed over the last five to 10 years, there's still a way to go to make it um, frictionless for mass adoption. I was going to ask you, Stephen, about um, to what point, you know, virtual travel may replace it to some extent, uh, real travel in the future. I think that answered that question quite well. What about in terms of uh, how people experience things? Are there advantages that in the way people will experience things in a virtual world, in a metaverse, as opposed to traditional travel? Um, well, I think I've touched on some of them already. The fact that, you know, for a start, if I wanted to take a, you know, a virtual trip to the Amazon rainforest, if I, if I wanted to visit the Amazon rainforest, I've got, well, I've got about 30 headsets sitting over there, but I could, I could grab a headset and I could be inside the Amazon rainforest virtually in about three minutes, um, possibly less. Obviously, from here, for me to fly to the actual Amazon rainforest, we're talking several hours of flight. So I would also need to get probably several shots to make sure that I'm, I'm healthy. I would need to deal with visas maybe to get into the country. It's gonna cost me quite a lot of money. So that, you know, there are those obvious uh, advantages to, to doing things virtually. You're obviously offsetting with the fact that, you know, I can be inside a 360 or even a 3D model, you know, a 3D environment that is a, a, an exact replica of a castle or you know a, a historic monument but it doesn't give me the same uh the same sense that i would have if i was actually there um i always refer back to one of my favorite movies goodwill hunting um there's a classic scene in goodwill hunting where um obviously matt damon's character he's he's an, an absolute genius and thinks that he knows everything and and Sean, um, the Robin Williams character, the psychiatrist, sits him down and basically says to him, uh, okay, you're so smart. Tell me what it smells like inside the Sistine Chapel. And he says, like, you, you can't tell me that because you haven't had that experience. You can recite every piece of information. You can tell me who built it, when it was built, why it was built. You know, you have all that encyclopedic knowledge, but to stand inside that actual space and look up at the ceiling is, you know, it's a unique experience and again drawing the, the parallel back to Sri Lanka and I should point out the reason I'm using Sri Lanka is because that's the most recent place that I visited um, you know st staying I, I stayed in the heart of the jungle it took me four hours to to fly there and uh, three and a half nearly four hours to drive from the airport into the, the place I was staying but that experience of waking up in the morning with the sound of the jungle around me and monkeys on the balcony that and the smell and, uh, you know, all those, uh, you know, visceral ex experiences beyond just what you see and hear, um, that is at this stage, you know, not something that we can recreate inside uh, a virtual space, inside a metaverse. Now, is that going to be possible in the future? I would not be surprised if it is. Uh, you know, we're already seeing tech companies start to explore, you know, the, the somewhat worrying <laughs> the somewhat worrying concept of, you know, uh, neural integration where, you know, you're, you're essentially plugging into someone's brain. We are dancing towards that scary matrix type territory where we've got something stuck into the back of our necks. Um, but, I'm, uh, you know, at, at, a, at a, you know, a less invasive level, we've, we've also seen people exploring ways to have tactile experiences inside virtual spaces 
ways to bring uh, smell into a virtual experience. Um, somebody after that, that, that travel conference I spoke at recently, I mentioned somebody, uh, one of the reporters asked me afterwards, she said, if I was in a virtual space and I, I was in, on a virtual ski resort, would I be cold? Um, which made me smile. And I was like, well, it, I said, if you access it in your house, probably not, unless you turned your air conditioning up super, super high. You know, there are location-based experiences where they do, you know, employ tricks like fans and, and, and different thermal dynamics to, to, you know, to evoke the sense of where you are, you know, putting a, a jungle-based VR experience inside a room with the, you know, the temperature set at, the, uh, at a comparable level um, is something that can be done, you know, professionally. Is it something that you're going to experience at home? Are you going to feel freezing cold if you're suddenly in uh, a snowy environment inside the metaverse? No, you're not. But conversely, you're also not going to have to put on that snow jacket that you'd be wearing if you were there for real. Um, one of the fascinating things about all this, Steve, is uh, you mentioned it earlier too in uh, metaverses like the sandbox is that we're seeing um, you know companies people whoever go in and acquire virtual real estate and much like in real life location is uh, quite important you know so you know if you're running a store then being located next to a, a Gucci or whoever it might be could be actually very very beneficial. What about in terms of the, the tourism or even integrated resort operators around the world is there a a need to get in sooner rather than later? Is there a benefit to being an early mover? Um, I mean, you're, you're talking to somebody that, you know, is very passionate about innovation and, and likes to be at the forefront and, you know, the bleeding edge of technology. So I'm probably a little biased to answer the question. But for me, you know, there's multiple reasons why companies should be at least exploring the space right now. I'm not saying they need to throw $100 million at it, but they, they do need to be, making sure that they've got their, you know, their, their thumb on the pulse of where things are going, um, particularly because, you know, we're not building this for us. There's going to be, as there was when, you know, we moved towards computers and then again towards mobile technology and towards social media, you know, Web 1 through Web 2, coming into Web 3. There's going to be a cutoff point in certain generations that just won't go anywhere near it in the same way that there was a certain generation that, like, oh, I'm not touching these stupid computer things. And there's a certain generation, oh, I can't understand these phones and, and oh, I don't understand that social media. There's going to be that same, you know, cutoff again, where certain older generations just won't engage with it. But this isn't being built for them. This is for that next generation, that next generation that grew up on, on Roblox and Minecraft and Fortnite and fully understand 3D spaces and live in 3D spaces albeit through through that 2D uh, screen right now, but it makes sense for them to be engaging with other people in virtual worlds. Um, and obviously the people that you're seeing now that are leading the charge, your Zuckerbergs, et cetera, you know, these are the guys that were playing World of Warcraft and all these other massive multiplayer games um, years ago that, you know, they have to a degree grown up with uh, you know, multi-user gaming uh, experiences. Uh, and this is really the evolution of that. So being forward thinking uh, and looking to, to future proof your, your company uh, is essential because you are, you know, you're not just servicing your, your, your client base and your customers now. You need to think about how the needs of the next generation customers are going to change. Um, something that, um, a good friend of mine shared with me several years ago is a concept called Martex Law. And Martex Law states that uh, the rate of change within organizations is, is generally very slow, but the rate of development of technology is exponential and it's very fast because computing power, you know, develops so, so quickly that it allows for the next, you know, iterations to come along every year. Everything's getting faster. And Martex Law basically states that as because companies uh, uh, innovate slowly and because uh, technology innovates quickly, the gap between them grows and grows and grows. And companies that don't keep ahead of new technologies, ultimately they can find themselves in a, in a position where they are too far removed from where things are at. And this can mean for some sort of reset. And that reset could mean, you know, 
firing a bunch of people and hiring people that know what they're doing. It could mean, you know, liquidation and, you know, we can't keep up anymore. And we've seen this, you know, we've, we've seen this with everything from, you know, MySpace to AOL. We've seen it in the tech space and, and, and beyond again and again and again, where, you know, somebody digs their heels and it's like, no, this is how we're doing it. And they, they don't keep up with where things are going. The second point I would say is, um, like you mentioned, location, location, location. Um, and we are seeing this already. You know, we see Snoop Dogg buy a big chunk of land in the sandbox and suddenly all of the plots of land around him are more expensive. Now, there's, there is somewhat of an irony to this because obviously, if you think about, say, a mall, if Gucci set up a store in the mall and then there's stores available, you know, spots available in the mall right next to Gucci, you can assume, therefore, that those spots would be more uh, coveted more, and potentially more expensive um, because people will think, well, there's going to be a lot of people going to Gucci, maybe not maybe too expensive, but there's going to be people going to Gucci or going to the supermarket, whichever example you want to use. So, therefore, having our brand next to that, get a lot of footfall and, therefore, we're going to get a lot more traction. And that is kind of the logic that's being applied in, in metaverse spaces is the idea that, look, right, Nike have set up here. So if we can get next to Nike, that'll be great for us. Or um, Snoop Dogg is set up here. Or McDonald's is set up here. So we want to be next to them because, because people will see us. But the, the irony here is that, and the misconception is, of course, that if I'm in a mall and I enter the mall, and I'm like, right, I want to go to the supermarket. I physically have to walk from point A to point B to get to the supermarket. And in the process, I see all of those stores and all of that marketing that has been put on my along my way, okay? It doesn't necessarily work like that. Nobody's going to be traversing worlds in a traditional way inside the metaverse because we can teleport, okay? Uh, if I, I can literally open up for in my, you know, my home space, go, oh, I'm gonna, I wanna go to uh, see th this event that's going on in Snoop Dogg's space inside the sandbox. And I've, as long as I've got access to it, bang, and I'm in it. I'm not walking to it. Now, is there a chance that I'll walk outside and see what's nearby? Yes. But if I've got access to infinite spaces and infinite worlds and an ever-expanding and limitless 3D version of the internet, I'm not necessarily going to go outside. It's almost like the, the ironic equivalent of, you know, somebody assuming that just because someone's visiting Amazon.com, that they might also therefore look at amazon2.com or they might look at next to amazon.com or like amazon.com they're not people don't randomly search like that that was the nature of you know the world wide web it was a you know it mirrored the human brain in the way that we connect dots between things and and you know the birth of the hyperlink what you're going to see is the evolution of the hyperlink so i'm on a website I'm not just randomly going to websites, you know, until I get to one I like. I go from one piece of information that links me to the next place that links me to the next place. Um, and then if that third place I end up on is something that's relevant to me, and something that's interesting, I might bookmark that. And, and, and when I want to go back there, I don't go back on that same route, do I? I go straight there. Mm. And that is exactly what you're going to get, but the 3D version of it. Um, um, and yeah, and, and then the third, I know I'm, I'm talking a lot here, but I, <laughs> I'm passionate about the subject. Um, the third thing I'll just po point out in terms of companies trying to get ahead of the curve is this takes time, okay? I can, you know, if, if at, at this point, if somebody's uh, come to me and said, oh, we need a website, even myself, I'm not a website builder, but I have access to tools like Wix and, and other website builders. You know, you can make a very professional website literally in a day. If you rewind 15 years, that process took a lot longer and it took a lot more people, but it's been streamlined and it's efficient now. We are at that nascent stage in, in this space. And unfortunately, as, as oft happens, there aren't enough people out there with the skills to, to build and code virtual spaces. So you will see that impact, you know, higher education, you'll see a push and a drive towards, you know, people that can, you know, whether it's coding solidity so that they can write smart contracts for NFTs or, 
you know, using Unity or Unreal to build virtual spaces or using 360 equipment or virtual reality equipment. Um, so again, companies now are, are, you know, you see the likes of McDonald's announcing, yes, we're moving into the metaverse. There's nothing there, but that's because they're building it. And, and it, it isn't like a, a, a 24 hour turnaround. It's not even a week turnaround or a month turnaround. These things take time and there's so many elements to it. And of course, they want to get it right because they have a brand and they need to make sure that their brand is, you know, it kept intact and, and, and well represented inside this brand new medium, especially if they are at the, you know, the tip of the spear because they're going to be the ones that get all of the additional column inches in the press. And therefore, they don't want that to be negative publicity. They want it to be publicity that is you know, beneficial to them. We should touch on gambling in the metaverse. Uh, uh, <laughs> <Do> we? <laughs> yeah, started to read a few stories about this recently, and uh, I mean, it's going to be a fascinating evolution in itself in how that's regulated uh, across various jurisdictions in general. Uh, what are your thoughts on on how this might evolve this gambling space and what these opportunities will be for you know potentially uh, current land based or i gaming casino operators, gambling operators? What can they potentially provide in, in this new space? I mean, again, it, it's the natural evolution of online gambling, isn't it? it it's where you went from, you know, if you, if you wanted to to play blackjack, you, you had to find a casino. And, and depending on where you lived in the world, you potentially couldn't access a casino. Um, and then the advent of online gambling, you know, changed the game significantly. There was then obviously issues in terms of regulations and people playing from countries where gambling was illegal, um, which, you know, reg regulators and regulatory authorities have, have, have done everything they can to, to, uh, to ensure that, you know, local laws are adhered to, but obviously VPNs are VPNs and people will always, <coughs> excuse me, find a way. Um, it's that same, excuse me, <coughs> it's that same, um, it's the same thing though. So my dad has played poker for 20, 30 years. Mm. He's good. Um, he mostly plays online. He mostly plays online for convenience. He does like once in a while, he lives in the UK. Once in a while, he, he does like to go to, you know, to a, a, a small casino or to a live game, but he mostly plays online. It's taken him a long time <clears throat> to be able to read people how people are playing poker online because you can't see them mm. it's a very different game poker online to when you're sitting around the table now i've played poker in vr i haven't played for a few years i, I, I think the last time i played was probably with my friend chris um before he died back in 2019 um we used to play once in a while and playing poker in vr is that you know, it is that experience again. It comes back to the fact that we, our world is 3D, and it's much more natural for me to be around a table, and my cards are there, and I can reach and pick them up and look at them. Okay, and you might be thinking, well, okay, great, but well, you know, I can play online, and my cards are in front of me. I can see that, but you know, it's a very different thing where suddenly we've all got mics, and you can talk to each other, but you can also see when the flop comes down and somebody picks their cards back up because they've forgotten what they had. And, you know, although I can't look at somebody's face and get tells from their face, we, it's a step towards that. It's a step towards the more in-person type of event. And I think it's quite telling that a lot of the big poker players in particular are investing quite heavily in the the blockchain space and in the in the metaverse space because they recognize that you know that is a, it's a great space to move into for them so steve that um you know provides quite interesting opportunities for operators in the virtual space what about regulation of gambling that's potentially where it gets quite complicated how do you see uh, that potentially working um you know i mentioned already that uh you know to buy it Dubai is, is, is a very innovative place and it likes to, to always stay ahead of the curve. And just in the, in the last 48 hours, they've announced this virtual assets regulatory authority. 
there's definitely a drive here towards being a you know a hub for the metaverse and for crypto adoption and, and nfts and all this kind of stuff and i think that you will see regulation you know the the, the early stages of regulation coming in, in in most uh most major countries um as they try to you know keep a lid on it in the same way that you know the early days of the internet was the wild west and then they realized hang on a minute we, we need to really make it you know, safe for people to be able to go online and, um, and you know, thinking about children accessing it as well. Um, I think that ultimately, you know, ultimately the re- your regulation is, is at an internet level, isn't it? Because I, I can still block a website and, you know, any virtual space is essentially running a server. I can still block a site, block a server at, uh, at a national level if it breaks the rules of, uh, you know, of, of a particular country or, or the, you know, the ethos of a particular um, uh, government, then you, you can limit people's access to, to, to stuff through there. Uh, in terms of the regulation of funds and the way funds are being transferred, <clears throat> and, and, you know, that's obviously a little bit trickier and, and we're seeing this already in the, in the DeFi space, in, in the in the blockchain crypto space. Um, that being said, you know statistics show that there's there's still a lot more um, uh, illicit activity in the you know traditional financial world than there is in the in the crypto space. If you look at it, you know proportionately, um, the the gambling space that we currently see in the the online world the world of online gambling i think that a lot of the the regulations that are used there will simply be transposed at least at first but then they will need to look at other things so for example game of poker and this is the classic matrix example okay there's that classic scene in the matrix when neo is first being uh, taught what the matrix is by morpheus and as they walk down a street full of faceless businessmen, this stunning blonde girl in a bright red dress walks past. And as she walks past, he looks around at her and it's not really a blonde girl in, in a red dress. It's Agent Smith, uh, well, a simulation of an Agent Smith. And, and Morpheus is making a point of, it's really easy to be deceived here. It's really easy to be uh, duped here. So flash forwards to the real world and we've got virtual poker taking place inside the metaverse am i allowed to wear an avatar skin that looks like kim kardashian because it might distract other players am i allowed to put on the skin of a professional poker player and clone his name and pretend that i'm him to gain access to events that maybe i shouldn't have access to that is the you know, that's the brave new world side of it that I don't think a lot of, uh, you know, companies and regulatory authorities are potentially going to be ready for that. That world of, um, you know, I, I wrote an article in 2017 called uh, V-Safety, and it was talking about how e-safety and online dangers, especially, you know, in terms of kids and access and, and, and education, how those transposed and magnified and augmented inside the virtual world. And, and that is a big part of it, the fact that it's easy to pretend to be someone else online. It's easier to be even more convincing inside a virtual space when I can take the corporeal form of a completely different person. Add on, you know, a voice changer, which is a relatively easy thing to, to be done these days. And suddenly you've got very convincing fakes. Um, and that you know, intersection of deep fake technology inside the metaverse, and particularly when money's involved, like in, in gambling, will be, um, yeah, will be quite quite the, the headline maker, I imagine, in the next five to 10 years. Probably a topic we could sit here and chat about for, for days, or <laughs> no doubt about it, but I, but I will leave it there. Just got one question for you before we go, though. Metaphorically speaking, will the metaverse take over the world? Metaphorically speaking, will the metaverse take over the world? Um, depends what you mean by that. 
will it? I mean, will Web three replace Web two inevitably? Will all interactions eventually be done inside a three D virtual space? Uh, potentially, I would say that we're probably you know a couple of generations away from it getting to that. And as with all transitions towards new medium, there's going to be that you know that that stepping stone process where, you know, some people are still working in this way and some people have moved on to the next way. And then eventually you're going to see one decrease and the other increase as each new generation finishes education and moves into, you know, into the working world. Um, do I think that, you know, metaverse right now is being used as a bit of a buzzword, you know, as a bit of a marketing gimmick. Of course it is. Of course it is because you've seen, some of the biggest names in the world, you know, show their interest in this. So, of course, some of the other, uh, you know, companies, you know, they're trying to to make sure that they seem innovative as well. But when the dust settles, you know, this new world is being built and it's not going to stop being built and there will be that transition towards it. And especially once the technology uh, gets to the point where it is frictionless, where it is as easy as you see it in stuff like Ready Player One or you know the Matrix without the thing stuck in the back of their head. But when it's as easy as you know, I grab a, a, something, put it on, and bang, I'm in. Rather than I've got to get out sensors and clear uh, my living room and you know make all this kind of space. When it when it becomes that frictionless, then you know adoption rates will will skyrocket. So, yes, I, I guess in a way, as you say, metaphorically speaking, it, it will take over the world. Um, I don't think that it's going to replace all human interaction. I do think it's quite telling. Spielberg said in, in the lead up to the release of the movie version of Ready Player One, uh, Spielberg said that he thought uh, one, one of the reasons he was interested in the story is because he, he sees virtual reality as, quote, the next great super drug. The next, uh, you know, the next global super drug that, uh, you know, the entire world could end up getting addicted to. Um, and I do think, again, tying back to what I was saying about, you know, safety and, and um, the way that we're going to have to moderate and, and, you know, refine how we engage with digital content, that that is going to play a factor, that it is going to be, for some, it's going to be, do I get up and head out into my real world where, you know, everything's not great? Or do I stick my headset on and go into this world where I'm a rock star? And, you know, it's going to be an interesting time as we as we move towards that and people's virtual lives potentially um, outstrip their, their real lives and finding balance between that, both in terms of our physical well-being and our mental well-being will be really, really important. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Steve. It's been uh, super insightful. As I said, we could talk forever, but we won't. Uh, thanks for joining us, Steve, and uh, yeah, I look forward to catch up in person as the world opens up again. For sure. Thank you.